November 20th. I'm Scott. I'm exhausted. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we make fun of the game of life. No, the other game of life. Let's do this. You know, one of the worst things in the world is when you're going you, you on You have to someone force you to eat poop and tortures you to do or something horrible like that? Go no, see. no. It's very much when you're going to go on vacation and everyone else in your house is going on vacation in a few days. So uh, you're running low on food in the house, but you don't want to go grocery shopping because you're either going to have to go again as soon as you get back or you're going to buy stuff that's going to go bad. As a result, there's not much food left. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I go down there, and there's, there's some food, but it's like I could defrost something, but it takes a while to defrost, and by the time it defrosts, we'll all be gone, and then it'll go bad. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think the real problem is that there's plenty of food, just Scott won't eat any of it. He doesn't like ham, he doesn't like sausage, he doesn't like crab. There's plenty of food. Like what? The thing is, you seem to like just have these, these blind, all you, the only food you see is like the food that I don't eat. Because all the food you'll eat is frozen and won't thaw before <laughs> well, we like, leave. Well, like, go to the grocery store, we'll come home, and you'll be like... I'll be like, all right, you know, the next day I'll be like, what do we eat? And you'll be like, oh, there's only stuff you don't like. And so you act like I don't eat any food. Well, no, because after we get mm -hmm. back from the grocery store, we usually eat, you know, things you'll eat, like chicken and beef. But then we eat all the chicken and beef, and the rest of it's frozen. So you know that there's that game, the Psychonauts game, that uh, people, it's one of those games where everyone's like, oh, it's the best game ever, but apparently nobody bought it. Well, and uh, like five people say it's the best game ever because no one else has ever heard of it. No, lots of people say it's the best game uh, ever. That, that I wouldn't say that many people compared to how many people play games. For, it's well, not no. a very well-known game. I'm talking game. about like, you know, the games, you know, journalism. If you go to any like, you know, blog of video games or any magazine of video games and you know, as for an opinion of Scott, Psychonauts, there's probably more blogs about World of Warcraft than there are about people. Than there are people who know about Psychonauts. Probably, what I'm talking about is, you know, in terms of the, it's a critically acclaimed game that did not sell well and is not popular. And despite critics continuing to bring it up and continuing to clamor for, you know, respect for this game that no one played and very few people bought, you know, it, it it's yeah. Anyway, so the game now, you can get it for free. Will it just work on my computer? It works on, I guess, Windows PCs. It's, you know, it's it, those game tap people, they let you like pay a monthly fee to like, get all these games on their service. It's, it's from them, but you can get it for free without paying for the monthly service, supposedly. So uh, that's all I know about it, but I assume it's the whole game for free. I played the demo of this game, and it's sort of a rough around the edges platform 3d platform game but the thing it, that makes the game special is like all the plot and the character designs and the levels and wait wait like wait that. so it's not a great game but i, know, I never said i thought it was a great game uh-huh i said it was critically acclaimed but many people keep talking about how it's some great game and uh they you know they want it real bad it's sort of like how they really want you know earthbounds in the u.s and they won't bring it it's sort of like hey you released this game in the u.s and no one bought it fix it and they, you know, it's one of those situations. People yell about how a game is so great that no one bought. Except, uh, I don't know. I mean, even the zero punctuation guy basically said, yeah, this game was great, but it's not actually that great to play. It's not actually that good of a game. Yeah, but you know what? I figure the demo was fun enough for however many minutes I played it, maybe 15 minutes. I've never know. played a single second of that game. Yeah, but. If you need a video game to play, and either you're poor or maybe you already beat all the video games that have come out or are coming out, and you sit in there and you say, man, I want to play a video game, and I don't have a video game to play, uh, That should never great. happen to you. There are already... <laughs> How many games do you have to play to run out of games to play now? Well, imagine if you were like a college student. And you had a lot of money, but you didn't have uh, anything to do. I didn't care. I played Tribes or Counter-Strike. Yeah, and I those know. games alone were enough to amuse me in my idle single hours pretty much continuously. I the know. only time I was ever bored was when other people were around and I didn't feel like playing a one-guy game. And I consider Counter-Strike to be a single-player game because there aren't actually humans playing with you. Yeah. The, the point is, is that... Uh, is that is it, what? A good free game. Nah, well, I, I thought we just agreed that it wasn't good. It was only critically acclaimed. No, oh, it, it, it's good. It's just not It's not super amazing. How good? Is it better than, I don't know, Mario 2? Uh, yeah. Is it better than Mario 64? Eh, maybe not. 
Is it better than Doom 2? He depends. I could just go play Doom 2 right now. You already played Doom 2, though. Yeah, but what you know what? Looking, what if you're looking for something new? I've never gotten sick of Doom 2. Well, that's you. Doom I got a little sick of, but <laughs> Doom 2 I played slightly less, even though it was better. So I feel like I could play through it a few more times. <laughs> All right. You got a news over there? Well, I tried to go buy a second DS Lite today, and, and I've, I've uh, failed at this before. I want to buy a DS Lite, but you know what? All the colors suck. But wait, there's one good color, gold, that's coming out. Oh, but it comes with Phantom Hourglass, which I already own. So what the fuck? Um, I point out that I care more about, I don't know, the system and how good it is and useful and practical is than what color the plastic on the outside is. I'm not getting the, uh, like the pink one, all right? It's not going to happen. Well, there's a black one. It's perfectly fine. No, I need I need the silver one or the green one or something. So you're saying that uh, aesthetics matter, that the look of your DS was going to force you to wait and then pay the same amount later that you would have paid now for a clearly superior product. Well, you know, if I already have a DS Fat that works, right, uh, I probably shouldn't buy a DS Lite in the first place. Well, then So our- if I'm going to buy one to replace, if I'm going to buy a thing to replace a working thing... I might as well wait for one that's perfect. It's not unless the, the green one costs more or the silver one costs more. Well, apparently the gold one does cost more. It does, which you notice I'm not buying it. I, just, I find it funny that you of all people now, oh, I got to wait for the special colored DS. I can't just use the normal DS. Uh, it, you know, given a choice where it's equal cost for the same thing, you're going to choose one but with it's a not better color. You're, you're forgetting the, the cost of inaction. The fact that every day... There is goes, no cost of inaction because I have a DS Fat that works. Uh, if you ever use a DS Lite, you'll realize that the cost of inaction is the fact that the DS Fat looks like crap compared to the DS Lite. The I've screen, used the DS Lite. It's better, but it's not so much better that it's hurting me. I'm it's not so much better here. that it is hurt. I can't play on a DS Fat anymore. The screen, I just beat Phoenix right through on the DS Fat. It was just uh, fine. Uh, you wasted that game on a Fat with an old screen. <laughs> Whatever, you crazy. People. It's like the worst thing you could do. No, it's not. The worst thing I could do would be to not play Phoenix Wright, which is what you did. Well, I'll be honest. <laughs> I liked Phoenix Wright 1. Phoenix Wright 2 was more of the same, but the puzzles weren't as fun, and I cared less about the story. And Phoenix I, Wright 3 is better than 2. It better be, because I'm not that excited about it, I'll be <laughs> honest. 3 I, I, I Plus, feel I like, think you just got to get past where you are in 2 to get to the good part. Well, part of it, too, is I started noticing, I think it was more so in the second one than the first one, that... They, I mean, they did localize the living hell out of that game, understandably. But I really think that they didn't change... They just changed the words, and they didn't change the facial expressions. Because people's facial expressions often do not match what they're saying at all. In 3, they match up, I think, a little better. Better than 2? Yeah. We'll see. Plus, in 2, I didn't even really notice them not matching up, so... <laughs> but yeah. I take the 6 train down, and I go to the GameStop at 34th Street, and I think, all right, I'm going to go grab two copies of Worms, and I'm going to grab a new DS Lite. Didn't you order the Worms on Amazon yesterday? Not yet. Oh. It doesn't matter when it comes if it doesn't come before I go on a trip, so I don't care. That's true. I'll try, maybe I'll try to get it at the... No, wait, I'm not going to any malls. Forget that. <laughs> I was thinking I'd go to the mall next to my parents' house. Well, that, I was like, that's what I'm I was like, at. wait a minute. Now, my news story, <laughs> ostensibly, is that the Wii is selling like crazy fuck, and Nintendo can't keep up, and there's shortages worldwide like always, and the reason oh. for that is pretty simply just... They're that, making $1.8 million and the demand is higher than that. That's, well, the, that's all there is to it. I think the reason the demand is so high is that the Wii was kind of this new thing last season. Now, it's established. It's known. People out there, even, you know, normal muggles don't play video games so much. They know what the Wii is. It's that Nintendo thing that everybody likes and everybody wanted. And there was a big rush for it last year. Oh, shit, it's Christmas. Oh, shit, I don't have a gift for little Billy. I should get him that Wii thing. And every parent who doesn't already own a Wii is buying a Wii for Billy. And there's a lot more than uh, 1.8 million of them per month. <laughs> yep. I mean, think about it. They're going to sell, uh, what, two points? There's two months left. 2.6 million Wii's. That's it. How many people are in this country? How many of them want Wii's and don't already have them? More than 2.6 million. But I didn't really think about that as news. I mean, oh, Nintendo's kicking everyone's ass again. Oh, my God. Well, money-wise, maybe not online content-wise, but I digress. So I go to this GameStop. And no, I expected a line. There's always a line, not just at that, that GameStop. Lo- that GameStop but- has the biggest lines of any GameStop. Thing is, 
every GameStop. I've realized now that of the last, like, six times I've gone into any GameStop anywhere in this country, I have walked out having put down the thing I was going to purchase and left in disgust because the line just didn't move. Well, except for the one uh, in Baltimore. Did I buy something there? I don't remember if you bought anything there, but I it was a pleasant experience. It was, but I wanted to buy something, and I think I remember failing. What did you want to buy? I don't know. Every time I go to a GameStop, there's some old used game I want to buy, but I always go walk up to the counter, and there's always two people, two employees. One of them is dealing with the kid who's selling like every video game he's owning, and the other one's just standing there not doing anything. And I usually go, God damn it, after 10 minutes, put my thing down and walk away. Yeah, that happened uh, one time pretty badly. Well, that happened to me when I went to the GameStop in Times Square not too long ago. Well, yep. not, not Rockefeller, but close enough. And it happened to me again when I went to 34th Street because there was one dude, man, in the line that went out the door. Even though Worms was cheaper, it was like 28 bucks for some reason. I, I wasn't going to stand in line for an hour and change. This is why I've been game. buying all my video games on Amazon. The only problem with buying video games on Amazon is that they might come like a few days after the game comes out. So you're not going to get the game on the release date. But you just go online, you click your mouse, and then the game shows up at your door with no trouble. You know what? It doesn't get better than that. Release date only mattered when I thought that I would care about the online offerings. And uh, now that Nintendo Wi-Fi is pretty much useless... Uh, it doesn't matter if I own the game the day it comes out or not. The only game that I care about getting it on the release date is, of course, the Smash Brothers, which I ordered from ebworld.com, or which is, you know, I guess is the same as GameStop.com. So we'll see if they can actually deliver the game, like, the day after the release date, or if, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. I think I'll live if I don't get that game right away. Yeah, I just figured, you know, because Amazon was... Back in before the game got delayed, Amazon's estimated ship date for the game was like a month after it was supposed to come out. So uh, I ordered it from the other site instead. But the, all this comes together in that I have a, a tradition. Not really a tradition, more of a, a rule tradition. to live by. One of, those, one of those things that allows you Tentacles. to live your life. In a way that is better. It's kind of like you have a rule. And you might forget why you had the rule. But anytime you break that rule, you suddenly remember why that rule's there. Like, don't pet the weird animals at the zoo. Don't go poke a hippo. Especially if it's angry. Especially if it's a hippo. Hungry, hungry. <laughs> but, uh, when I went to that GameStop, I realized that I had vowed long ago that... From the end of September until the middle of January, I will go nowhere near a retail establishment unless I am forced to. Because Except the grocery store. Eh, I consider that necessary food and not so much retail. <laughs> yeah, it counts as retail, I guess. I it's don't not think, wholesale. I don't think many people count that as retail. Anyway. And, uh, yeah, I made that mistake. I went to that goddamn GameStop. You know how long it took me to fight my way into the door? Let alone to fight my way back out. Let alone to even get in near the place. Because all the people who are shopping for Christmas. And, uh, once Thanksgiving comes, well, God, I'm just not even gonna get in my car. Yeah, I just don't go to stores in the winter until, you know, The worst like thing, January. around here, you pretty much can't drive north. Because once... Thanksgiving goes by, the road that goes by the mall is pretty much a sea of people trying and failing to get into the mall until January. Yep. So, you know, I, I went and I, it, I, since I am a, duh. What was that? <laughs> duh, near my work, there's some <laughs> stores I can go to. So, like, I needed a winter hat. So, I just walked to the EMS near my work at, like, 10 and I bought a winter hat, you know. So, I, I have a way to get things if I need them. But you could have bought it online. A winter hat? Yeah. Where? And the shipping? Amazon. The shipping's practically nothing. <gasps> yeah, I think I'd rather, like, try the hat on. It was $15. Uh, winter hats all fit the same. No, they don't. They're yeah, different they, sizes. There's three sizes. Little kid, normal, and big head. No, there's different sizes. No, there aren't. They're all the same. <laughs> Win knit, like, winter hats are all identical, except that mine had a Zelda on it. Oh, well, the ones on uh, the internet here are more expensive, so... Yeah, military, Gore-Tex, cap, black, 20 bucks. You gotta get the one like George Costanza had. What kind did he have? He had that big Russian thing. Uh, no, you know how much those cost? Yes! Like a zillion dollars. <laughs> There's a real f wool, uh, real fur on the side of those things. That's not wool. Fur. It's fur. From animals. Anyway. Things 
of the day. Surprisingly, I had not actually seen this before. It's a bunch of deleted scenes from The Life of Brian. Oh, you took my future thing of the day. It's <laughs> <laughs> gonna use that. I said I was using it. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, the one thing I can say is that whenever there are deleted scenes, especially from Monty Python stuff, they're usually not that funny. Whenever there's deleted scenes from anything, there's usually a reason that they were deleted. No. Well, no, there are two times. Either it was deleted because it wasn't that good, or it was deleted because of censoring. Yep. And in the case of the latter, it's usually hilarious. <laughs> usually. Sometimes it's deleted for other reasons, though. Like, just they ran out of time in the episodes, so they took out the least funny joke, but the least funny joke is still pretty funny. That could happen. Yeah, though, more and more I feel like a lot of movies purposefully have deleted scenes just so they can put them in the extras. Yeah, I think they're purposefully, like, you know, they... People just come up with scenes and they film them all. And then in editing, you know, some of them they just don't put in. Or, you know, they know they're filming more scenes and, and they, then they're going to put in the movie in the first place. Yeah, but these scenes are all about, it looks like, semi-Nazi but Ottoman-style German suicide soldier extravaganza. It's just a bunch more Dude. with those guys. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's those guys. It, it's pretty funny. Like the part at the end there. It's funnier than the uh, deleted scene from uh, Bonnie Python and the Holy Grail, which no, was never actually filmed, or at least if it was, we don't have any footage of it. I've seen an animated version of it where people did the voices, and I have the script for it, but it's not that funny. No, nah, it's really not. I think the only good joke in that at all was there's a bunch of archers that only have one leg, and when they're marching, they go left, left, <laughs> left, <laughs> I left, wondered how left. they were going to film that. <laughs> That's probably why it didn't make it into the movie. <laughs> They gotta have all those one-legged guys hopping. Actually, what's really weird, if you ever read the original screenplay, like, the early treatment of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, it's a totally different movie. Well, has, you know, if you, if you have a plan to make a movie, and you go to make that movie... It ends with God not knowing how to drive an automatic. Yeah, but I mean, you, if, you make, if you make a plan to make a movie, and you go to make that movie, you'll end up with something pretty close to the plan. If you got a plan to make a movie and you get drunk, and then try to make that movie, it's going to be nothing like the plan. And you know what they did? <laughs> the latter. Ah, Graham Chapman, we <laughs> hardly knew ye. All right. So can I do my thing of the day? I guess. All right, well, we were talking about Phoenix Wright before, right? Oh, we were. Yep. You like, uh, you, you like Phoenix Wright? Uh, I think I made my statement uh, <laughs> earlier about that. It's okay. Well, it's pretty funny. I like those Phoenix wrongs until they got stupid. Yeah. Well... Imagine if you took the Lolcats, which are pretty amusing, and the Phoenix Wright, and you combined them, and you had a great quantity and varying quality. I see what you did there. Here's a gallery of Phoenix Wright Lolcats, and, uh, well, some of them are lol, and some of them are epic lol, and some of them are eh. Oh, and I should point out, because Scott didn't tell me until I saw one, spoilers for the love of fucking God, spoilers! Yeah, some of these are pretty spoilerific. Like, someone will say, I'm in your blank, blank in your blank, and that's, like, the what happens at the end of one of the mystery cases or whatever. Now, granted, one of those spoilers that I actually knew what happened in was, uh, hilarious, shall we say? <laughs> yeah, some of them aren't spoilers, too. You know, some of them are miss-spoilers, but... If you look at all these and you haven't played all the Phoenix Wrights, you're going to... Well, there's no spoilers, I guess, for Phoenix Wright 4, but the spoilers for 1, 2, and 3. But that's it. So, yeah, Phoenix Wright fan, you owe it to yourself to look at these here and get some lols. So, back at Kineticon last year, which is an awesome con, you can pretty much guarantee we'll be guests again this year, but uh, we did a panel on German board gaming and board games in general, and we got a guy in the audience who... Really, a has really, uh, he's a hassler. No, no, I was gonna. He really wanted us to talk about American board games, and we shouldn't, you know, slight the American efforts in the field of board gaming because American efforts are just as valid and important to the the medium of board gaming as the German and French efforts. So, I thought it was about time for us to talk about an American board game. Well, actually, we were gonna talk about an extremely German game, but since we only ever played it once or twice, I decided to. Uh, not do that and do something else. Oh, you decided. That's right, I decided. It was my idea. Actually, no, I think the reason I decided not to do that was that I want to have Alex on board for that show, since uh, he has as much experience as me, which is twice as much as you, and I figure between the three of us, we can... I think we should just play more before we do that show. Yeah, the real <laughs> issue there is just that we actually came to an epiphany 
and realized that we had beaten and become dissatisfied with almost every board game we had ever owned. And we realized there's only two directions to go. That game, which is pretty much the last bastion of fiddling with abstract cubes. And then the other direction, which is all the way abstract and just playing Go. Maybe. But anyway. Well, my Go board's in the mail, so. Yeah, so we're going to today, we're going to talk about an American board game that when I was a kid, I liked it a lot. And now I hate it to death. I can say this. When I was a little kid, I liked it in terms of playing it with the family. But at the same time, I often angered my family because I would pretty much constantly throughout the game, whenever anyone in any way insinuated that them doing better or worse than anyone else had anything to do with skill, I would begin the argument that I always began, which was, we would might as well just flip a coin. This game has about as much skill as flipping a coin. In fact, I could probably affect the outcome of a coin flip more so than I can the outcome of this game. And my family would always say I was just a curmudgeon who couldn't just lighten up and enjoy a fun board game with the family. Mm -hmm. We're talking about probably one of the more derided yet well-known games in America, and that is the game of life. And we're not talking about, you know, the, the mathematical uh, game of life, you know, that computer science students will study. That game is awesome. That is an awesome game that's not really a game you can play so much, but... You can. Yeah, uh, you can, In kinda. fact, there is a game... That is based in that game. That's true. It's kind of like that 7-Up Spot game. Yeah, but, you know, if you want to learn about that game of life, I suggest you go ask Google about it or wait for us to do a show about it or something. No, but we are talking about a game that is designed to teach children a few important things about life. Like, for example, if you don't go to college, you're going to lose. <laughs> Two, the more kids you have, the more money you'll have. Not true. <laughs> well, in the game, it's true. It's patently true. Three, life insurance will always pay out. Four, car insurance will never pay out. Nor will fire insurance. I don't even know why that was in the game. And right before you're ready to retire, you've got one shot to make it big, like super big. And if you fail, you'll be super poor. There's pretty much two options in life. Millionaire tycoon or... Philosopher. <laughs> I like how philosopher is well, what no, happens. Well, no, this millionaire is the default. Millionaire tycoon is the super lucky, and philosopher is the not is the sucky. Uh, I love I love a game that teaches you that philosopher means you lost. Yep. Of course, I guess if, if money is the game, that's probably true. All right. So the game of life. Here's how this game works. Everyone has a car, and in that car, you put yourself. Now it has to be. There's a little pink uh, phallus for a man, and a little. Uh, well, for a woman, I guess. I have a little blue phallus for a man. I guess the pink phallus is to represent rim. They're these little peggy things, and they stick in the car. Right. And so you drive your car, and the first, and basically the way the game works is you spin this spinner, which is numbers 1 to 10, and then you move that many spaces. And if there's a fork in the road, you can choose which way to go. And every time you pass a payday spot, you get your salary, and if you land on a payday spot, I think you get your salary in a card, whatever. This is cards you can ignore. And if there's a fork in the road, you can choose which way to go. The game is Candyland plus money. Pretty much. And I guess why I liked it when I was a kid. Let's start with that. When I was a kid, I liked it because you actually got to choose which way you were going to go. So it felt like you were making some decisions. See, now, here's the, the real <laughs> issue. My family decided when I was a kid that it was cheating to count ahead at a fork to figure out where you'd land and oh, choose, that's the, bullshit. choose the best everyone, path. Everyone can count whatever they, way they want. So they made a rule. You can't count. And uh, I just counted. And yeah. as a result, I don't think any of them did. I don't think anyone else cheated but me. So as a result, I tended that to win. That wasn't cheating. You're allowed to count. Yeah. That's sort of the point. Well, the other thing was I could spin the spinner to whatever number I wanted, but that was... Well, that's because the spinner sucked. They should have used a, a D10. <laughs> anyway... The, yeah, and then, uh, so you move the number of space on the spinner, you land on a space, and you do what the space says. And eventually, you get to the end of the game. So why else did I like it when I was a kid? The other reason I liked it was because in Monopoly, what, the biggest dollar bill was like 500, right? In the game of life, the smallest bill is 1,000. And you could get, the biggest one was 100,000. They were white. Yeah, it was like, you had mad monies playing this game, and it felt really good when you're a little kid, just have like a zillion dollars. You're like, oh man, look how much money I got. You could also get promissory notes and go into debt. 
Yeah, if you went into debt, they gave you these twenty thousand dollar promissory notes, and it was like you had to pay them back, and it was it really sucked if you got them. But I always sort of wanted them because they sat there unused because no one was ever bad enough to actually get them. Bad enough that that is the, you can't be bad at that game. <laughs> there you cannot make poor decisions. The only decision you can make that's bad is skipping no, college. Yep, right at the beginning of the game. Oh, and buying fire insurance. Yeah, uh, right at the beginning of the game. You can, you know, there's a little, this, you, you make a few spaces, but then you can choose to go right or left. If you go right, you have to go through a lot of spaces, and it's going to take you a lot longer. If you go left, you can run through really quickly to sort of, you know, get ahead of everyone and sort of beat the game faster, which has advantages. But you'll only get, like, a high school diploma if you go that way, and your salary will be shit. If you go the long way, you have a, a chance of landing on, you know, different degrees in, from college, and you could land on, like, doctor, and your payday will be, like, 40000 And I think if you go to high school, your payday is, like, 16000 So you're going to end the game with almost no money if you uh, do the high school thing. Yeah. yeah, there was also, I mean, going ahead had the one advantage in that there was the bridge, and the first dude to cross the bridge, that was always a big deal when you were playing it as a kid. Oh, shit, the bridge! Everyone who crossed after had to pay a toll to whoever crossed it first. Yeah, the bridge is pretty close to the end of the game, though. Yeah, it just meant you got a bunch of money from everyone. Yep. The other the other thing in the game that you can do is some spaces you land on, well, some spaces you pass allow you to buy insurance. And it's pretty much you can choose yes or no for auto, yes and no for life, yes and no for fire. And all they do is during the game, you might land on a space that says, hey, if you've uh, got insurance, do this. If you don't have insurance, do this. And it's usually good if you have insurance and bad if you don't. And uh, so it costs money to buy the insurance. You have to decide, you know, what are the odds that I'm going to need this insurance? Is it going to make a profit for me in the long run? And at the end of the game, if you still have, because sometimes you might lose your insurance, if you still have insurance at the end of the game, some of them you can turn into money. Like you can ch turn your life insurance into money at the end of the game. Uh, what else? That, the only other thing in the game is that some spaces you land on give you children and wives and kids and all that stuff. And you fill up your car with people besides yourself. And the more people you have, the more money you get. So you want to get lots of people. And that's the whole game. For some reason, this game has kind of legendary, iconic status in the United States. Everyone's played it. A lot of people like it a lot. Even people who are uh, not six years old, which kind of surprises yeah, me. Yeah, it's like, it's like one of those big games in this country. You know, it's very historic, like Monopoly, Scrabble, the game of life. Like, these are like big... You know, very big parts of, like, Americana, in a way, these games. But the game, now, I mean, not only was it not a game, I mean, it was about the same level as Candyland, but it went one it step further. It was Candyland with one step further, that's it. But the step further it went was that every choice you made, there was the obviously, clearly superior choice... And the stupid choice, the I want to lose this game choice. There was no middle ground. There was no debate. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like, huh, man. You know, I, if I go around the board this way, I'll, I might become a doctor, and at least I'm gonna be like, you know, a teacher, and make some money. If I go this way, I'm gonna be broke ass poor. And even though I might have a chance of getting to the game fa end faster, that's not gonna make up for the money I'm gonna lose. There is no reason to ever skip college ever. That's the dumbest. You just lose if you do that, unless everyone does that. Or so why would you do that? Life insurance cost pretty much nothing. At the end of the game, I believe it's worth 100000 It's worth a lot of money at the end of the game. There's no reason not to buy life insurance. I mean, even if it never pays off on any spot, even if you land on every spot on the board that says, ha-ha, life insurance, you lose, it, if you still hold on to it at the end of the game, you're okay. The only way it can fuck you is if you buy it and you happen to land on like the one space that says lose your life insurance. Now, not only was the game completely random, but they added this extra fuck you at the end. Where, they, see, you know, we talked earlier, you can win or you can double win, tycoon win. Mm -hmm. and Anyone at the end of the game can choose. Well, I think what it is, is as you approach the end of the game, right, on the board, you're getting to the final space on the board. The final space on the board is millionaire retiring style, right? A few spaces before that, like five spaces before that, is the day of reckoning space. And when you get to the day of reckoning space, no matter what you spun, you have to stop there. And there's a whole big set of stuff you have to do on the day of reckoning. And then you decide, are you going to bet it all on becoming the millionaire tycoon and the instant winner? 
Or are you going to just end the game normally and hope you have more money than everyone else that you can win? Which, money is not secret, so you can pretty much just calculate that. Yeah, so it's like, huh, you look at how much money you have, and you figure out how much money you're going to have after you land on the millionaire. I space. always hid my money. Yeah, you look at how much money everyone else has, and you say, well, if I end the game normally, do I have a chance of winning? If yes, then just end the game, and you just go to the end. Now, if no, you might as well gamble on the 1 in 10 chance of automatically winning. Now, the rules were very clear. There's this little rainbow board that's like a strip. It has 1 to 10 on it. You take all your money and your car and everything you've got in front of you. Your insurances, your cards, everything. And you put them on one of those numbers. Then you spin. And if you make that number, game ends immediately. You double win. Everyone else, it's over. You win. 1 in 10 chance of just winning. So no matter what you did the whole game, no matter what, even if you became the shitty teacher, even if you, you know, just spent all your money, even if you're holding a fistful of promissory notes, at the end of the game, you have a 1 in 10, 10 chance of just automatically winning, no matter what. How's, how's that for a good game? It, I mean, on one hand, I, I would say, oh, well, maybe the game is good for kids because it's simple, and like Candyland and all that. But what really bothered me was that the Game of Life kind of got re-released a bunch of times. And from what I've read of the re-releases, they dumbed it down. That game wasn't dumb enough for kids today. Well, I know that the version I had was slightly different from the version like my parents had. Well, like, I, my, I had the like 1960s version. I had, I think, the 19, ni early 90s version. So, but yeah, like, uh, the game also had these cards that you could get at certain times and they let you do stuff, but we mostly ignored those cards. I don't even remember that. Yeah, they were sort of like community chest cards, but not really. You sure those weren't just in your newfangled version? They might have been, but that made the game more complex, so, as opposed to the more simple. So I consider that a good thing. I think you got one if you landed on a payday instead of going past one. I don't remember exactly. I just, I really, I can't understand why this game is popular among people or why it has retained its status as, like, the game Americans play. They well, play Monopoly. They play this. There are a lot of American games that boil down to roll the dice or spin the spinner and move forward that many spaces and see what the board says. I mean, Monopoly, uh, Careers, uh, Candyland, Uncle Wiggly... The game of life. There's a whole bunch of them, and they're all the same exact game, pretty much. The shoots only... and ladders. Oh, but shoots and ladders is actually good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble. Sorry. Right. There was one good game. It was called Payday, and I remember pretty much it was you have to make it through the week and pay all your bills with your paycheck, uh -huh. and it was kind of learn about managing money. Learn oh, so not to waste money on crap. So it's an educational game, even if it wasn't a strategy game. It was also a little bit strategic. All right. But yeah. So the thing that all these games have different is the theme. And I guess it was the theme of the game of life that really carried it along as opposed to, uh, you know, the game itself. The theme was just kind of very, like, 1950s idyllic. You, you, you marry a nice young person and you have a million kids and then you retire after working your whole life. Yeah, it was pretty much the American dream guaranteed. And well, no, doesn't because if you failed you could at Millionaire be the Tycoon... You became a philosopher, and it showed this sad little goat <laughs> it did show this really on sad the goat. sad little farm right next to the mansion where everyone else was living. I always kind of wanted to be the philosopher because it was like that space on the board didn't really get used. Ah, I... That was the other thing I did. I always went for Millionaire Tycoon no matter what. Really? Because, and... Then uh, why even bother doing anything the rest of the game? Because it's just, you might as well just spin the spinner right at the beginning. My rationale was that, all right, mom and dad and brother... I would rather be a philosopher. So if I have the chance of being super wealthy, but also a philosopher, why am I not going to take that chance? Yeah, it's like... Well, What's like, so bad about being the philosopher? The only thing about the... Uh, I say I win. The only thing about becoming the philosopher, the only reason you don't do it at the beginning of the game is because whoever gets there first has the first dibs at it. So it's sort of like if you do that right away, that's not quite right. You had to like roll a d6 to see who gets there to, you know, because it's whoever gets there first is completely random. All that you could do is just flip a coin or roll the dice to figure out who wins, and then roll a d10 for everyone in order of the number they got on the first die to see if, no, they win, and that's Well, it. no, because then the person who goes last sort of has an advantage, because if no one else wins, then they automatically win. They don't have to roll the d10. Well, no, they just have a 10% chance. Well, I guess it, it's uh, 10 it, whatever. It works. <laughs> Believe me, it works. Anyway... The Game of Life is a pretty sad game. I don't recommend playing it. See, it's not even... 
I mean, I guess it was nominally fun when I was a kid, but that was mostly because I played it with my family. Yeah, and- it was because I played it with my family and my relatives, and, you know, we were kids. We didn't really understand. We liked to play with we'd like to put the people in the cars and drive the cars around and play with huge amounts of money but and- as a kid once i played monopoly while it wasn't a great game skill mattered a lot more there than it did in life and oh I pretty, it sure did i pretty much hated the game of life from the day i knew the game monopoly onward yeah it's something like that i i just feel like if you're a parent and you got a kid, give them Carcassonne. Or at least give them Monopoly. But the they Game get, of Life... They have Kids of Catan that you can get and get have your three-year-old playing the Settlers. I'll say that I think the Game of Life has absolutely no redeeming qualities. Mm. Other than to make fun of, retroactively. I, I think I'm going to show you the first redeeming quality of the Game of Life. Oh? Everyone's going to tell their stories of the Game of Life in the forum for fun times. Ah! <laughs> but even then, it's re- pretty much retroactive making fun of. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I guess one use it could have is that if you force a kid to play the game of life, then he's going to appreciate Settlers a lot more. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.